My name is Amy Straczewski, and I'm the Associate Director of the Oral History MA program here at Columbia. Um, so today, uh, tonight's event is part of our ongoing public workshop series, which is part of the curriculum for our students and part of our way of engaging with a broader public audience. Um, so this year, the series is focused around exploring the intersections of oral history, health, and medicine. And that focus has really come out of our ongoing engagement with the program in narrative medicine, and especially with our conversations with Science Honey Dust Gupta. And so uh, we couldn't really have this series uh, credibly without including her, as I said to our students before, and we're so pleased um, that you're here to share your thoughts with us tonight. Um, I just want to mention that this event is co-sponsored by the program in narrative medicine and is part of the Paul F. Lazarus Fellows Lecture Series. Um, I'll pass around the sign-in sheet in case uh, people are here who want to keep in touch with the oral history program um, and hear about future events. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary Marshall Clark, who's the director of the Columbia Center for Oral History Research um, and co-director of the master's program, to introduce Sayatani. I've been learning from Sayatani for a long time. The first time was when she was my student in 2001. <laughs> and, um, uh, she was an extraordinary person during the time of the post-9-11 crisis. She taught me a lot about how we would do our work with people who were uh, of, you know, from different countries and different ethnicities and different skin colors and the predominant you know, uh, group of people that were being written about and being concerned about as the victims, heroes of 9-11. And she did that right there in the class and um, her work was so innovative and her, so brave and her own work that she was doing, that I, she's always been my teacher. Uh, originally trained in pediatrics and public health, Scientani Descapta, MD, MPH, is faculty in the master's program in narrative medicine and co-chair of the university seminar in narrative health and social justice, both at Columbia University. She also teaches in the graduate program in health advocacy at Sarah Lawrence College and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society's Medicine, Literature, and Society track at Columbia. And by the way, she has a couple of kids. <laughs> uh, now I lost my place. So I'm only at the beginning. She is the co-author of The Demon Slayers and Other Stories, Bengali Folk Tales, Interlink, 1995. I just asked her if she was writing books. She said yes. <laughs> the author of a memoir about medical school, which she had done before she came into class my class, and co-editor of Stories of Illness and Healing, Women Write Their Bodies, Kent State 2007, and Globalization and Transnational Surrogacy in India, Outsourcing Life, Lexington 2014. Her creative and academic work has been published in diverse places, including Ms. Magazine, Z Magazine, JAMA, uh, the Hastings Center Report, The Lancet, and Literary Mama, and included in such collections as Dragon Ladies, Asian American Feminist Brief Fire, Fifty Shades of Feminism. Health Humanities Reader and the forthcoming Keywords in Disability Studies. She also writes online in Salon, The Weaklings Feministing Racialicious, Adios, Barbie, The Feminist Wire, Sociological Images, and Everyday Feminism. So when you go home, start reading. <laughs> <laughs> talk this evening is um, narrative humility, medical listening, and oral history. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to explore the interconnections of these two fields, but particularly through the lens of how I've been deeply influenced by oral history theory and oral history practice um, in my own classrooms. But before I go into all that, what I thought I would do is read you a poem that will, I think, explore some of these issues more thoroughly and beautifully and bravely than I will do subsequently. Um, it's called Story Water by Rumi, by the Persian poet Rumi. Story Water. A story is like water that you heat for your bath. It takes messages between the fire and your skin. It lets them meet and it cleans you. Very few can sit down in the middle of the fire itself, like a salamander or Abraham. We need intermediaries. A feeling of fullness comes, but usually it takes some bread to bring it. Beauty surrounds us, but usually we need to be walking in a garden to know it. The body itself is a screen to shield and partially reveal 
the light that's blazing inside your presence. Water, stories, the body, all the things we do are mediums that hide and show what's hidden. Study that and enjoy this being washed with a secret we sometimes know and then not. Stories matter, mm -hmm. right? I don't think I'm you know, speaking to the wrong crowd here when I assert that stories matter. Stories are the way we human beings shape our worlds. They're the way we understand our, understand our lives and our identities. They're the way we move through our days understanding and sharing the stories of others. Particularly though, in the face of illness or adversity, injustice or trauma, stories help bridge what sociologist Arthur Frank has called the narrative wreckage, the point at which one's old life's plot is no longer valid, and we need a new plot to continue one's life's journey. But, and this is kind of where I'm gonna focus my talk today, Stories are also about power. The demand that we ask questions regarding stories, questions that some of you who've been in my classes have heard me ask endlessly, uh, including whose story counts? Who owns the story? What voices or stories go unheard? Who gets to speak and who is perpetually spoken for? But let me back up a moment and explain to you some of what I was talking um, to the oral history students before about, which is my own professional relationship with stories. So as Mary Marshall said, not only am I a physician and a writer, but as a faculty member at Columbia University's program in narrative medicine, I'm someone whose academic work is all about stories. And of course, when I tell people that I teach in this interdisciplinary field called narrative medicine, I usually get one of the following reactions. Usually somebody says to me, Oh, wow, narrative medicine, I love that, that sounds fascinating. And then, after a beat or two, the inevitable question. Um, so what, <laughs> what exactly is narrative medicine? <laughs> um, and in case any of you listening here today, including those of you in the narrative medicine program, um, had a similar question, let me just frame how I see the work of narrative medicine. Now, even my colleagues, you know, who also teach in the program may not frame it this way. This is my particular framing. Uh, so I have a couple of elevator speeches I tend to give about narrative medicine. The first one's longer, and it goes like this. I say, when people ask me, uh, narrative medicine is the clinical and scholarly movement to honor the central role of story in healthcare. And I make this big metaphor. I say, long before doctors had anything of use in our black bags, before we had diagnostic CAT scans or treatments for blood loss or cures for tuberculosis, what we had was the ability to show up, right? What we had was the ability to listen, to stand witness to birth and life and death and suffering and joy and everything else in between. But over the years, as that black bag has become more full of wonderful technological innovation, please don't get me wrong, cures for TB, CAT scan, these are good things. We're happy we have these things, yes? Um, but what we've done is we've pushed to the side, um, both in training and in practice, that simple ability to witness another story, another's story. We're not training for it and we're not practicing it. And what I and my colleagues in narrative medicine and in different programs across the country call different things, uh, medical humanities, literature and medicine, and various programs of this sort, health humanities programs across the country, what we're urging is not that we forget all of those wonderful life-saving technologies, but rather that we once again, and just as rigorously, train clinicians to elicit, interpret, and act upon the stories of others. Um, that we hold on equal stead multiple ways of knowing, right? The scientific and the storied, the informational and the relational. Although, even just to create a binary between those two things is problematic, but, you know, suggesting somehow the science and story are fundamentally separate from one another, but I digress. Okay. Um, if I'm in an elevator, I would also say something like this. I would also say, you know, we would never graduate somebody from medical or nursing or therapy school who didn't know their anatomy or kind of knew their physiology, right? 
How can we graduate people who don't know the first thing about how to deal with another human being's story, which is the fundamental building block of the healthcare enterprise? Um, so stories are, you know, if we agree that stories matter, if stories are the fundamental way that we interact with our fellow human beings, it's no longer good enough, like just not good enough, to assume that the ability to engage with stories is somehow magical. Like you're either born with it or you're not. And if you're not, and you're in medical school, maybe we shuffle you off to like some subspecialty where you don't have to deal with awake and storytelling patients that much. Uh, it's absurd, right? It's absurd and it's not good enough. If we could take somebody off the street and put them in English graduate school and you know, teach them how to interpret plot and frame and metaphor in some wonderful you know, classic novel, if we can put them in anthropology uh, school, graduate school, and teach them how to elicit stories, if we can put them in oral history uh, graduate school and teach them how to interact with subjects and their stories. Why can't we do the same in clinical professions? We can, we should, and we are. And um, okay. So, of course, this is a really, really long way to answer. By the time it takes me to say all this stuff about like, oh, why don't you know, why, you know, how can we graduate people who don't know they're about anatomy and physiology? The elevator has come and gone, right? Um, nobody's listening to me anymore. They've glazed over. They're calling me on the phone. Um, so. When people actually ask me what I do, and they don't have a lot of time, sometimes I give them the shorter answer, which is, I teach people how to listen. But the question is, of course, how? How does this teaching happen? And how we expect those trainees to listen? When I was in medical school, I was taught listening, or bedside banner, maybe it was called, um, in a very, I think, in a very telling way. Um, I don't remember if it was called Health Communications or Bedside Manor, but whatever the course was called, it was very clearly something that wasn't central to my curriculum. It was something maybe at the end of a long Friday or at a lunch hour. I don't remember now exactly how it happened. Um, but when I was brought into this class, I was brought into a room where there was no instructor. There was a video of an instructor. And so we were being taught how to listen to people with like not a human being in the room teaching. <laughs> Fascinating. Very strange moment. Um, so it was this video screen of a white-coated physician in the video, you know, in the video, behind a very long table. So on the video, long table, white-coated person, um, who was teaching us a set of nothing wrong with them, techniques like research shows that, you know. Physicians who stand in doorways of rooms are often perceived as not listening and perhaps are sued 33% more than physicians who are sitting at the bedside. So lest you become one of those 33%, please consider sitting at the bedside. Uh, look at a patient in the eyes. Uh, when somebody's done speaking, pause for two seconds. Beat, beat. And then you know, repeat back to them the last three things they said to you. And look, I have not. There's nothing wrong with looking people in the eyes. I like looking people in the eyes. There's nothing wrong with sitting down. I think people should sit, sit down in hospitals. Um, there's even nothing wrong with repeating back, you know, what somebody has just said. But to me, this is kind of you know that the faking it till you make it right thing. These are all um, these are all behaviors which enact listening. They're not really a process of teaching listening itself, right? Um, and so these are processes which are different than any real attention to power and hierarchy and how listening itself can be an act of social justice, right? How listening itself can be an act of freedom. So rather than teaching clinical trainees how to look like they're listening, Maybe we should, and you know, hey, it's a really out there idea, but maybe we should actually just figure out how to teach them to really listen. Um, but of course it's not that simple either, like I make it sound very simple. Because the flip side of this is that in fields like narrative medicine and health humanities, as much as we honor stories in medicine, I often really stress to my students 
the idea that let's also not get too precious about them. Let's not think that just simply having um, a course called narrative something or, or listening to somebody's story, that, that is necessarily inherently um, the end all and be all. That's not the end of the conversation. Um, because stories aren't inherently kind of magical or healing or just. In the words of the writer Chimamanda Adichie, she says, stories matter. It's a statement I started with, right? Stories matter. Many stories matter. But, she says, stories, let's re remember that stories have also been used to dispossess and to malign as much as they can be used to empower and humanize. She reminds us that stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. And so if stories can be used to dispossess or malign as much as they can be used to empower or humanize, the question of how becomes even more critically important. How we tell, and certainly how we listen. Or at least how we teach listening. And that's really the focus of my um, project today. The question of how we should be teaching listening in health humanities disciplines inspired me a number of years ago uh, to develop this idea that's the title of the talk, this idea of narrative humility. Um, OK, one more medical school story. When I was in medical school, <laughs> alongside those fascinating videos of the man and his white coat in the long desk, um, I also took courses in something called cultural competency. <laughs> cultural competency. So this was a class where I would be handed lists of things. Like here, and my students have all heard me wax off about this, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but this was a class that where I'd be handed a list of things. Like here are ten things that Dominican Americans believe, and here are ten healthcare practices of Vietnamese American immigrants. Yeah, and. I would be handed this list with the expectation that I would memorize it. And once I did memorize, okay, susto means this, this is what cupping is, right? I would memorize this list, and once I memorized the list, I was competent in dealing with these communities. Um, and not only was this distressing, because it was a fairly limiting understanding, um, but particularly as a woman of color trainee, um, it was really distressing to kind of wrap my head around the idea that these others that I was supposed to be learning about, boy, they seemed a lot more like myself than many of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really inspired post-medical school. I was really inspired later when I was already um, a fellow and teaching to come across a 1998 essay um, by Melanie Turblon and John Marie Garcia, uh, two healthcare educators who suggested the term cultural humility as opposed to cultural competency or cultural sensitivity in guiding clinicians in serving the needs of diverse populations. If cultural competency as a term suggests it's somehow possible to become entirely competent about somebody else's culture, Turbulon and Murray Garcia said, well, cultural humility, it's not about looking out at the other. It's about looking in at oneself and examining one's own sources of expectations and prejudices and frames of listening and how right and how one person's story may be particularly appealing because it's familiar and another's may be frightening because it's not familiar right it was the process of kind of inward looking at one's own processes of listening yeah cultural humility so building off that idea i thought well cultural humility kind of suggests or at least to me because of this cultural competency history I had, it suggested that it was something we only did when those other people walked into our office. And so what if we just thought about it as narrative humility? What if we just accepted that every single person's story that we encountered, whether that person had skin color or economic history or sexual identification that was similar or different than us, every single person's story potentially held elements of the unknowable. And every single person's story demanded that we look inward at our own kind of expectations and frames of listening. Um, so narrative humility suggests an engagement with stories that acknowledges that stories are not objects we can comprehend or ever become entirely 100% competent regarding, 
But as oral history teaches us, there are relational events, right? With real life people on both ends of them. A position of narrative humility understands that stories are relationships that we must approach and engage with, remaining open to their ambiguities, their contradictions, engaging in self-evaluation and self-critique about our own role in the story, our expectations of the story, our responsibilities to the story, and our ownership, co-ownership of the story. And by thinking about it as narrative or cultural humility, we open that box and we understand that every single story potentially has elements of the unknowable in it, while simultaneously, and I think this is critical, while simultaneously not losing kind of that structural understanding that certain people's stories are marginalized more than others, yeah? So as my favorite rock star, historian, oral historian, Alessandro Portelli notes, <laughs> an inter slash view, an inter view is an exchange between two subjects literally a mutual sighting. One party cannot really see the other unless the other can see him or her in turn. The two interacting subjects cannot act together unless some kind of mutuality can be established. The field researcher, and I would say the physician, the nurse, the right, we could sub in anyone there, but he says the field researcher therefore has an objective stake in equality as a condition for less distorted <coughs> communication and a less biased collection of data. So if listening and healing and teaching are fundamentally intersubjective interviews, interviews, and so experiments in equality, then this is a lesson deeply needed in medicine, where a lack of attention to power creates bad practice. Not just dissatisfactory relationships on both sides of the stethoscope, but sometimes bad diagnosis, loss to follow-up, wrong treatments, right? Again, back to the how, but how do we teach for power and listening? How do we teach for equality? Well, and this is why I'm here, one answer is oral history. And this is why I'll make, right here and now, the rather extravagant assertion that all clinical trainees, all medical students, all nursing students, need to be trained in oral history. <laughs> there, I've said it. Wow. Uh, <laughs> nothing has happened. Um, that Human. Indeed, all these things. Because of the robotics. There you go. <laughs> that all clinicians should be oral historians. Now, okay, in the absence of me having any real ability to mandate that this happens. Um, <laughs> one small thing that I do in my um, interdisciplinary illness and disability narratives class that many of you are taking right now, um, is to teach from oral history theory, is to have oral history theory deeply guide my own um, teaching, and also to have oral history practice um, help shape the final assignment in the class. And as many of you know fondly, um, we're in this class, the final assignment in this particular class is to um, conduct a single life story interview that my students, yes, Michelle is nodding, having done this exercise, that my students conduct, transcribe, and write a paper about over pretty much the entirety of the semester, framing their understandings of the interview with readings by oral historians like Portelli, uh, like Anderson and Jack, trauma scholars, Holocaust scholars like Dory Lau, medical narratologists like Arthur Friend. They also use the illness and disability narratives that we read in class together to frame their understanding of their interviews. So here's an excerpt from one long ago such oral history project that one of my students conducted. And I share it here um, with that student's permission as well as the interviewee's permission. Um, so this student of mine was interviewing her elderly father, who was a brutal diabetic, who was slowly losing his ability for independent living. In her paper, she compared him to Jean-Dominique Bobby, the completely paralyzed author of The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, a text we also read in class earlier in the semester. In her paper, she described her father's condition as the locked-in syndrome of the aged, writing, Sustained by memories, reflections, and dreams, and the adventures of the wanderings of the mind, time will be fleeting, 
and yet it will be all he has. I know there is no currency strong enough to buy his freedom back from the kingdom of the sick. Now, I'll be reading a couple other excerpts, but I want to tell you a bit more about this assignment. I've been doing this assignment with students probably for the last 14 years, probably since I studied with Frank Marshall. Um, and it's developed over time as I've learned from students. Um, I used to simply ask my students, we are in an illness or disability narratives class, we'll be reading some narratives, we'll be writing some narratives, I want you to go and listen to a narrative. And I used to say, so go and find somebody in your life who has, who's over 18, who can understand you know, what's being asked of them, um, who has a, you know, who identifies as having a chronic illness or disability. And I used to just frame the assignment like that. Um, and I used to ask, from the beginning, I did ask, you know, influenced by oral history, that students approach the interview as a life story interview, not as a medical or medicalized interview. Um, allowing the interviewee to tell or not tell of their illness or disability as they chose to, um, to begin and shape their story how they see fit, right? In disability theory speak, I encourage an approach to subjects through a citizenship model rather than a patient model. And sometimes this was hard, particularly for students who were already clinicians, so somebody who was already, let's say, a doctor or a nurse or a therapist and was used to asking a certain set of questions. When did your symptoms begin? What makes it feel better? What makes it feel worse? It was hard to kind of unlearn some of that. Certainly some of my, we were talking about this earlier, some of my journalism students <laughs> would have a hard time kind of unlearning, like, well, I want to ask these 10 questions and I didn't get through all 10. I, you know, this is, a, I failed my interview. I didn't, you know, she wandered off into some other arena and never even talked about her rheumatoid arthritis. And I'd say, congratulations, that's wonderful. You listened to this great story, now you have fantastic fodder for your interview to write about, you know, for your paper, to write about your own expectations of the story and your own reactions to it. <coughs> anyway, um, so certainly, you know, there's been some challenge and some unlearning that needs to take place when I use this assignment in the classroom and push my students to do a life story interview and push my students, again, to examine their own frames of listening. Right, to kind of give up on that idea that there's 10 things that I need, you know, 10 pieces of information and fact that I need from this interview, right? To giving up on that notion is hard sometimes. Um, but at the same time that I've, you know, patted myself on the back, oh, I'm doing this great thing, I'm encouraging a life story approach, I've had to acknowledge over the years that in a class called illness and disability narratives, in a program called narrative medicine, Medicalization and the power of medicine to subsume and drown out individual narratives is something we have to continue to struggle against. Toward that end, I've done something kind of goofy. I've <laughs> amended that initial framing of the interview, trying to be transparent with my students about why. And I ask instead that my students interview, instead of saying, okay, go interview somebody with a chronic illness or disability. I've tried to broaden it, I've, and now I say, well, interview somebody with an embodied condition that they're willing to talk about. And so people are like, say what? <laughs> I said, I don't know, maybe it's an illness, maybe it's not an illness, maybe it's an illness. And so I do this like weird hand waving and I have to be transparent about my own discomfort. But I feel but I feel good about it, even if my students are like I don't know what she's talking about, embodied condition. Um, but the reason that I've done that is I want to leave room for people to define or not define their own bodies and conditions as they will. One example, the big D deaf community, you know, who deeply resists the label of illness or disability, but thinks of themselves as a linguistic minority community. I want to leave the door open for interviews that let people to let both interviewees define what they're talking about themselves and let my students kind of gift or, or receive um, that defining from their subjects, right? Not to come in and say, oh, well, I want to interview you about your ex. But tell me, you know, what you want to talk about today, right? Do that oral history kind of approach to their own listening. 
Another example of how this has been really useful, um, folks who don't walk around with a diagnosis, <coughs> right? Folks who have symptoms, folks who have fatigue, that their doctor says is one thing, but they think is something else. Folks have pain that nobody can tell them where it's coming from. There needs to be room for these people to tell their stories. Why? Because these are actually the stories that are the most marginalized in medicine. These are the stories that are never heard, right? Um, I'll tell you about one particular situation. Um, it, 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 actually, multiple students ended up doing um, interviews with this community that I felt uncomfortable with. Um, I had a student come up to me and say, well, I want to interview my friend who's trans and is transitioning. And I said, what are the politics of even implying that, that, that there's an illness or disability label with that? Does your friend feel comfortable? Does your friend know the title of this course? You know, what are the, what are the politics of that? And she said, no, no, no. My friend really wants to do this interview and wants to talk about this embodied experience that deeply has to do with medical power, that deeply has to do with the way they have to interact with, you know, jump through hoops in the medical establishment, and, you know, they understand. And opening it up to kind of that embodied condition allowed that set of interviews to take place. And in fact, um, this particular student um, then ended up, yes, interviewing their one friend who had an embodied story they really wanted to share, a story that had to do with their body, and social constructions of identity, medical power, colonization, um, kind of the policing of gendered binaries. Um, but as a side note, that interview then went on, and that student of mine went on to do a broader oral history <coughs> project for that trans health collective that that friend belonged to. Um, so, you know, serving that trans health collective, collecting oral histories, and then use that work to launch into a PhD program. Um, so these life story interviews have become, over the years, a chance for my students and me to think about how we understand the relationship between embodiment, stories, social justice. They have become opportunities for activism, both within and without medicine. One example is the example I just gave, the student who went on and did a series of oral histories for a trans health collective. Um, you know, the trans health collective was asking her to do these interviews. Um, here's another example of a student who became a food safety activist after interviewing a relative with severe life-threatening allergies. She writes in her paper, what theorist Arthur Frank is advocating, I believe, is empathy, a quality that shouldn't just translate into feeling, but into action. I hope to carry on my subject's message, combining both our voices into one action-oriented campaign. And I think this activation of the listener is at least in the context of my class and how I have been taught to use this exercise by my students, inevitable. In the words of cultural critic Geither Spivak, ethics are not just a problem of knowledge, but a call to a relationship. Um, and this is unlike medical interviewing, which becomes a call to knowledge, right? A knowledge acquisition. And this exercise, I hope, is the antithesis of that. It's a call to a relationship. One last story from this particular exercise, one last example. Um, another student of mine a number of years ago asked me if she might interview a family member who had late stage ALS and was unable to speak. And this is an oral history exercise. And I was really hesitant at how this exercise in listening, in the listening act, would happen with a nonverbal subject. But as usual, and so I, I hesitated, I hemmed and hawed, ah, you know, ah, maybe, maybe not. But as usual, it was taught well by my student. Um, she videotaped the interview with her subject's permission and showed us. And what we watched was, I think, over the 14 years of doing this exercise, one of the most moving um, interviews I've had the privilege of watching. We watched her sitting next to her interviewee um, as he sat in his wheelchair with his breathing apparatus and his splints, and she would ask a question, and he would begin his answer in writing, because he was nonverbal, um, and it was his left hand, which is the only hand he had control over, and when he got tired of writing, she would read aloud the partial answer 
you know, and they would laugh, is that an E, is that an S, right, they, they would laugh about it. And she would ask him, is this what you were writing? You know, she would add a word, she would take out, right? and he would nod or not, and they would go on. There was actually multiple times where he said, she got it wrong, and they would go on painstakingly, slowly, almost letter by letter, co-authoring his story together. And in her words, the interaction is central and what he is writing is secondary. He is having his say, and I am the instrument giving voice to his thoughts. To my absolute surprise, I enjoyed the sound of my voice while listening to the tape afterward. I believe this is because, although you can only hear my voice, it's not really mine alone, it's ours. Our real-time experience put both of us in the moment of his immediate thoughts and gave his voice meaning. It was a joyful experience. So there it is. In the absence of being able to mandate that all clinical trainees all over the world become oral historians, which I would love to do, um, but this is how I found one teeny tiny window into teaching medical listening through oral history. And this is a kind of listening that's, again, not so much about gathering knowledge as it is about engaging in a relationship and discovering aspects about oneself as a listener and truths about the listening act altogether. Whether in the classroom, the clinic room, or the oral history project, listening can't be understood outside of a relationship between power and politics. And that's ultimately the kind of the note I want to end on. What I try to do through a lens of narrative humility is to teach my students to listen simultaneously to multiple levels of narratives, the individual and the social, the personal and the institutional. And in so doing, engage with the political underpinnings of narrative acts and to think about our responsibilities in witnessing any narratives, but certainly narratives at the margin. This approach to stories, I think, is a first step in not just shared consciousness, but activism, as one of my students said. We only have to remember that the social movements, uh, from the civil rights movement to the 1970s feminist movements, were rooted in the personal to political connection that enacted stories can make. So if disease, violence, terror, war, poverty, oppression manifest themselves narratively, then certainly resistance, justice, healing, activism, collectivity can be products of a narrative-based approach to ourselves and the world. Cultural critic Trin Minh Ha makes the following critique of anthropology, but I think it can be equally applied to medicine as well. She writes, anthropology is mainly a conversation of us with us about them, in which them is silenced. Them always stands on the other side of the hill, naked and speechless. Them is only admitted among us, the discussing subjects, when accompanied or introduced by us. But through an attention to power and politics, through an interdisciplinary approach using oral history, adapted oral history practice, the health humanities can change the way that medical listening is conducted and understood. In the words again of Dr. Spivak in her classic, Can the Subaltern Speak? She writes, we all know that when we engage profoundly with one person, the responses come from both sides. This is responsibility and accountability. The object of ethical action is not an object of benevolence, for here responses flow from both sides. The ideal relation to the other, then, is an embrace, an act of love. Such an embrace myth may be unrequited, as the differences and distances are too great. But if we are ever to get beyond the vicious cycle of abuse, it is essential to remain open-hearted, not to attempt to recreate the other narcissistically in one's own image, but generously, with care and attention. So here, we're going to look at the All right. So I'm going to end with another lovely poem by Rumi. Um, called listening, because again, I kind of like to gesture to wiser folks who've been thinking about these things for much longer than I have, <laughs> right, and make my comments come in the middle. Um, so this poem is called Listening. What is deep listening? Summa is a greeting from the secret ones inside the heart, a letter. The branches of your intelligence grow new leaves on the wind of this listening. The body reaches a peace. Rooster sound comes, reminding you of your love for dawn. The reed flute and the singer's lips. 
The knack of how spirit breathes into us becomes as simple and ordinary as eating and drinking. The dead rise with the pleasure of listening. If someone can't hear a trumpet melody, sprinkle dirt on his head and declare him dead. <laughs> Listen and feel the beauty of your separation. The unsayable absence. Let me say that part again, because I'm really into that part. Listen and feel the beauty of your separation. The unsayable absence. There's a moon inside every human being. Learn to be companions with it. Give more of your life to this listening. As brightness is to time, so you are to the one who talks to the deep ear inside your chest. I should sell my tongue and buy a thousand ears when that one steps near and begins to speak. Wow. <laughs>